In this video, we are going to talk about how to test boards. And um, we are going to have a closer look at this uh, bed of nails or test uh, fixture or test jig, how it is called. Uh, we are going to learn how you can create this by yourself. Then uh, we are going to talk about what kind of additional hardware you may need to connect to, the, to this uh, bed of nails and also how to write the software which will help you to test your boards automatically or half automatically. And after uh, you finish watching this video, I really hope you will be like, hmm, it's not so difficult maybe I could try to make this kind of test for the board what I'm designing now. Okay, so that's the goal of this video. Because uh, once you find out it's not so difficult, uh, it can actually save you quite a lot of time uh, during uh, production, during testing your boards. And uh, it means it will not only save you time, but it can actually save you also some money. I wanted to create a video on this topic for quite some time, but you know, it's not so simple to find someone who can talk about this topic until recently when uh, I was watching this uh, Dave Jones video where he received this uh, Magic Duck device. And this device can be used to test your boards. So I got curious, I wanted to know who is behind this product, behind this company, and I found Sean. Sean is the founder of Magic Duck. I sent him email, uh, asked him if he would be interested to talk about uh, testing boards, and that's what you will see in this video. We had a call with Sean, which I recorded, and uh, ask him some questions. Uh, very first question what I asked was about uh, this test jig, and that's how this our call is going to start. So next I'm going to play the clip uh, from our call with Sean. Here it is. So this is like a, um, a mechanical interface. This is a portion, this is the test jig, and then this board right here would be the one that is under test. Test jig, sometimes they call it uh, test fixture or uh, that's what people can also hear. Sure, sure, yeah, test fixture uh, or jig, yeah. Okay, okay, then uh, how it is tested. So we insert the board on these mm. pins. Yeah, so this is a really simple example. Basically what they've got is just a spring-loaded uh, pin context. Those are these uh, star, star uh, configuration ones. And then they've got a plated through hole uh, pin on their, their board under test. And then they've just run those traces off to whatever uh, DAC module they're going to be using. Um, so basically so they connect it to all the pins on the connectors. And they also provide yeah. like power through these pins and uh, they like uh, power up the board and then they measure all the outputs and inputs or how it works. Exactly. So so you can actually see on their um, on their silk screen here, they've got a ground connection, right? You see uh, TX and RX, so this is probably a UART bus. So they're able to throw that board into various uh, modes because they're gonna be communicating with it digitally. Here's VN, so this is a power supply of some kind. So they're gonna be um, you know, just measuring some very basic stuff, maybe loading some test software onto it and just making sure that thing's alive. Very simple test. So uh, what are the steps? How this uh, test, uh works. Uh, so you put that this board and then what is happening next? You... Yeah, so it's, it's going to be a very simple process. Um, this is actually the test jig under construction you, you see here, but this, uh, this test pin, this standoff here is going to be removed and eventually you'll just have a PCB that you can slide down on top of these, um, these little test pins which holds it in place and they're going to run some software on a, on a computer which is going to run it through a variety of um, basic tests and they'll either get it back a, you know, a pass or a fail. And if it's a fail, it'll probably tell them why, which individual test failed. And uh, that's how you can make a decision on shipping or reworking a board. 
how this point looks uh, on PCB. So we can we can look at a three dimensional model. Here's the top side of the board, right? But on the back side, you've got these exposed pads. Um, now these are very very generous. These are three millimeters in diameter. Obviously, you can go smaller, but the bigger you go, the easier it is to connect the uh, these pin style uh, pogo pins. These are what you're going to use uh, if you can't afford to put a uh, plated through hole through the board. If you can do a plated through hole, those are actually tend to line up better. You can see here that we've got uh, plated through holes that are being used for connectors. These Before these connectors are mounted, you would have the option of using one of those star uh, pogo pins to interface with it on the, on the board. And if they are mounted, mounted uh, can you use like different uh, kind of needle? Um, well, you're probably not going to want to go directly into the back. You know, if, if this connector is already mounted, you're probably not going to want to touch that pin directly with a, with a pogo pin. You can probably place another exposed pad off to the, off to the right, like I've done here with this three V three line. Um, but remember you've got a connector, right? So, uh, if you, if you're up for making a two sided jig, you can actually come straight into those connectors with a, um, with a pin if you really want to. So there's, there's lots of options. I, I would personally lead towards just leading a pad off of it. What is the smallest test point? Smallest test point? Yeah. Well, what you're going to want to do is is look at the uh, the data sheet for um, for these pogo pins. But like I mentioned, uh, you know these are very very fine tips. But the smaller you go on that on that pad, the higher probability that the pin is going to slide off of the pad, and then you won't have connection and you'll get a fall. And so you're really going to want to be generous on. So um, is it because uh, when you use the uh, fixture a lot, then the pins are going to be a little bit uh, wiggly or? Yeah, absolutely. So this really speaks to how, how many cycles you need to get out of your test jig. This sort of thing right here, this is good for a couple thousand until these, until these, these pins start bending around and start to become a nuisance, right? So, you know, maybe you're thinking you need to get, you know, 10,000 cycles out of it. You might be thinking having a piece of Lexan or plexiglass uh, plate on top of your PCB that holds the test pins, just putting some holes in that and they kind of support them. You can buy these uh, these sort of pre-made jigs here, at least the mechanical hardware. That's that's like 150 oh, bucks off AliExpress. I didn't know you can buy it. So who who make these? Who makes these? Oh well, uh, well I don't know. Th these are fairly generic. You're you're just gonna want to look for test jig on AliExpress or just Google it on the internet, and you'll you'll find a variety of generic manufacturers for these sorts of things. And you get these, you know plates of plexiglass and it's up to you to send that plexiglass off to a laser cutter to get the the holes put in and you're going to have to design your own pcb interface to those to those test pins right this is sort of like the intermediate way to do it if you if you're looking at a few thousand cycles or greater i but would like you, to you ask know, when when we when yeah. we are here uh how do you connect these uh, needles because on the top yeah. i've seen they are soldered directly to the board or yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I personally prefer to, to solder them in. Uh, just you make what I call an interface PCB here and, and just, just go straight at them with, with the solder. That's that's probably the best way. Some really old fashioned places will actually run a run a line directly off of the, the test pin uh, and do it. You know, they'll, they'll do it by hand, but not not advisable. You don't want to make an interface PCB. So now this this is the Ingen test jig. This is like you know, if you want to go pro and you're thinking 50,000 and above cycles, you can actually go ahead and buy a, uh, uh, like a mechanical fixture. And as you can see, it's the same basic premise of these test jigs and interface board. Oh, I'm sorry, these pogo pins and interface board, but this whole thing sits inside this test fixture. What's cool about an Ingen test jig is that the, the force applied is directly vertical, right? Can see that come down, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's quite helpful. You'll find that other things like this, that board is not being applied directly vertical to the pins, so that can cause a little bit of um, force on the pogo pins, which you know eventually can get them to jam and stuff. So so that's why people pay the extra money for something like this. But really, so I there are bother. like multiple points where the board is uh, pressured for better contacts. Absolutely, all these, yeah. all these white so tips. 
dad yep exactly so these white tips are what's putting the board down but this mechanical jig you can see this hinge right here it's actually going to be forcing that board vertically straight down onto the pins which is better for the pins than you know a, a less expensive jig where this board is coming in at an angle mm -hmm. right and it might play it might place a bit of sideway force on, on these pogo pins which might eventually cause them to jam but like i said i wouldn't worry about it unless you're thinking greater than hundred thousand cycles in a month you know or it is generally not a problem you can get away with something like this sometimes you have these these traces run directly to the to the edge of the board i think these are called castellated edges or something and we've had occasionally had a few clients say like how can we possibly test that well you can actually get pogo pins that are right angle uh mounted and that's what they've done here so this is a good way to avoid soldering directly to a board um, in some cases, you know, maybe smaller run production or very, very simple test jigs, you can actually just go ahead and maybe that, that board you made has a, has a connector or a wire harness that comes off of it. Sometimes you can just make a special wire harness that connects to that board. And then you can run that off to your test, uh, fixture and you might not even need to interface with, with pogo pins. So that's another approach. Yeah. But I remember, uh... Uh, the problem with this is it takes time connect and disconnect the ah yeah absolutely absolutely and but that would be you know that's a, a decision you need to make as an engineer is you know uh, if I'm only making a hundred a month maybe it's okay right it, to spend it you know a little more time on manufacturing and, and a lot less on design but surely if you're making twenty thousand then maybe you do need to be thinking about more automation and and no more you can't do hand connections yeah. Well, here's a here's an example, kind of a, a sample test script for how like a very basic test jig would operate. Um, this is available for your viewers just in a GitHub if they're interested. But basically, when it comes down to testing, what you got to do is you got to write up a list of the individual tests you want to perform and then what you consider a pass. So let's take, for example, a five volt uh, voltage uh, line for your USB bus. Let's say that has to be within plus or minus half a volt, right? Then you need to measure that, you know, get a pin against that that bus, and then and measure it, and then, you know, if it's okay, you pass, and if it's not, well, then you fail. All of those uh, tests need to be uh, logged into, a, you know, some sort of file. The easiest way to do it is just write the results to a text file and save it in some common repository. So we can walk through the code here and just take a look at what that looks like, right? So basically, your uh, mm, PCB where all, all yeah. these needles are, you need to connect this PCB to another device, which is going to measure yeah. all these uh, signals. And then this device Absolutely. is connected to a PC and this PC is running uh, software, for example, this one, which mm. is then measuring all the voltages and everything that we need, currents and anything yeah. else. Yeah, you've got it exactly. It in the most simple form, you need two things. You need a, a DAC, a, di a data acquisition module. That's something that maybe LabVIEW or my firm Magic DAC can provide for you. And you need, that's for analog measurement, things like voltage, uh, current, things like that. And then you need to talk to your board digitally, right? This is typically called the USB host adapter. And there's a firm called Binho that makes a really good one that I, I'm, I'm familiar with. But um, anyways, yeah. So what you do is you'd... Um, yeah, this is just some Python stuff. Basically, you need to import the libraries to operate with that hardware I just discussed. The first thing I, I typically do is I read the serial number from the board. Okay. Right? Whatever board you have, it has a micro on it. You're going to want to get the serial number. And that way, you can save that log file with the serial number so you can find it in the future. So we're just going to go ahead and get the serial number. Here, I've simulated it. But you talk using the Binho adapter to get the serial number. Probably want to figure out, you know, what the current time and date is. Put that in the log file too. Write a head uh, header file. I'm thinking now. So uh, yeah, the good. board ID. Uh, yep. Does it mean you have you need to communicate with the microcontroller through UART or, for example? Yeah, exactly, exactly how you do that. Yeah, you you use the the USB hub adapter to talk to the UART bus, and then that thing talks to your micro and. Okay. You know, or I square C, for example, if yeah, I like separate. Yeah, absolutely. Any any kind of digital bus to talk to your microcontroller. 
Yeah. Okay, so the test equi equipment, it may be able also to connect to I2C and then read all the, I don't know, check sensors or something. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're typically going to be tied into the digital buses of your, of whatever hardware product you're making. Uh, in most jigs I've worked on, um, you typically wind up writing some test firmware on the microcontroller. So you're gonna one of your first step is is to upload that test firmware, and that that test firmware ha might have a mechanism of passing you back packets, right? Mm -hmm. So you send a digital packet saying request serial number, and then it throws back a packet with the serial number, right? So there's a little bit of uh, I guess test software you can write, but that's at a fairly sophisticated level. At the most basic level, you you can just be looking for analog voltages, and you know that at least you'll know the thing's working, or at least it's on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's, yep. uh, All right. So, what else is need? Yep. So we so we got our serial number. The next thing to do would be to look at your voltage rails, right? So let's take for example a board that has a three v three line and a five volt line. How do you switch on? Well, where do you switch on? Uh, you need to. You have a way yeah, to so switch on the power, yeah? It depends on how your board's architected. Some boards, the second you you apply power to the to the um, you know the connector, whatever the power input is, the board just comes on, right? So when this board has gone into the test fixture, typically the, the test fixture is applying power to that board, and so it's already come up. But yeah, if there's some uh, switches or anything else to turn on the board, then yeah, your your test jig is going to have to simulate those switches. This could be as simple as if it's a manual switch, running two test points across that manual switch out to say a relay that you control with your test jig. You flip the relay and the board comes on. Do bear in mind if if there's if you do turn on that board with a relay, you're going to want to put a time in between in, to allow like all the voltage rails to settle to a steady state condition. You don't want to be measuring things during an inrush event. Okay, so you got these. So you, you know, you just go ahead and read the analog input. Here you can see we've done that, right? And then the next thing you do is you test it against your pass fail criteria, make a decision, log that, and move on. Now, of course, it's up to the engineer to determine whether a pass fail is critical or not. If if you realize that this board is behaving so badly that you don't want to continue with the test, you you need to stop it right now. Sometimes you can pop up some, you know, a text message to the user. It says, hey, stop it. Think about this. Do you want to retry or do you maybe want to just take this board out and put it in the in the, the bin to be reevaluated? Um, so that's a decision you can make. Some other tests are less critical. Maybe you want to continue. So you'll have to do that based on your knowledge of your own board. For example, uh, the more critical is when very high current is driven by the board. Sure, absolutely. You might have a short condition. So speaking of current, that's the next thing we might want to look for. So let's see, we've got, uh, now we're going to look at the, the board current draw in just the normal state, right? So again, we're going to use binho. We'll be sending some packet to the microcontroller. Microcontroller will interpret that and send the board into whatever its steady state condition is, right? The average use case. Then um, we're going to use, sorry, okay, go ahead. So what exactly this binho is doing? Well, I can show it to you. Um, let's take a look here. This is just a pretty standard USB uh, bus controller. And as you can see, it allows you to use Python to interface with uh, all manner of digital uh, protocols. So you can use uh, you know, I2C, as you mentioned, or UART, and you can send data packets to your microcontroller, which can then be interpreted by, by the microcontroller to do something with your board. It's that simple. It's a it, it's a software library, and then it's a, a piece of physical uh, hardware. And let's show you what that uh, okay. looks like. Pretty simple thing. There it is, right there. So it's this piece of physical hardware. This little bit here plugs into your chest fixture. Oh, there you go. There's a picture. See, computer, little adapter, board. So basically, you don't need to worry about drivers or something. You just take this hardware, you take their drivers, and on, on top of the driver, you can directly access yep. the uh, standard peripherals like UART or I2C and talk yeah, to them. You got it. Exactly. And then you do basically an analogous thing 
with the hardware, with the analog measurement. It's the exact same thing. In this case, you're going to be using a DAC like this one here. Same deal. USB cord from your computer to this DAC, and then this, you know, individual wires from this DAC, maybe a ribbon cable to your test test fixture. S super simple. You get a you get a with the analog input mechanisms. You get a, a Python library, right? And you're going to go ahead and just import that Python library. Uh, let's see here, right here. All right. And that's going to allow you to communicate with this Magic DAC hardware. And you can go ahead and read an analog input. See, right there. Mm. Pretty simple. Are we good? Nice. Yeah, I understand. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, so now we understand we're just using those two chunks of hardware. To, to interface our computer with our test fixture. So in your product, you actually have two boards, or if I understand right. Oh or... yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So, so with the, um, yeah, the, like I said, the firm I've got, Magic Deck, we use this DAC, which is fairly standard. This thing does analog measurement, uh, digital pins, you know, maybe some PWM outs, right? And then we offer a, an optional additional product here, which is uh, we call it the MA board. And this thing adds some additional features like current measurement, temperature measurement, relay switching. And uh, here you can see the relays on the back there. And that sort of allows you to do things like, uh, say, this current measurement right here. It's just right out of the box. You just connect the DAC to our MA board. We provide some uh, equations in the data sheet for how. Our, uh, the voltage out of the MA board being read by the DAC uh, equates to current, and you're good to go. So you basically, on your board, uh, you have some a resistor or something, and then you measure voltage across the resistor, and that's how yeah, you let's, let's look at the schematics. Why not? Let's let's check them out. Um, well, let's start with the relays. Relays are pretty simple, right? You can see we've got a nice snubber across there. Um, how about a current measurement, right? We use a, uh, it's just as you mentioned, it's a sense resistor right across there. And then uh, that's turned it into a, a linear voltage. Um, and we even offer a micro, micro current measurement, uh, uh, very low current, like 150 microamps or something. That's for your, your sleep state current measurements, uh, which is pretty common in, in small and like wearable products, you know? Um, this one's this one's kind of key, right? Because if you have any maybe misplaced components or solder bridges, even if they're high resistance, this sleep state current's going to pick that up and realize that you're you're leaking more than you should. So, yeah, it's really really pretty straightforward stuff. As you can tell, th these tests can get as be as simple or as complex as you need. So you're going to want to match that complexity to be equal to your board board's complexity. So all these commands of, or these features, what do you use? They are specified yep. by the API uh, oh, yeah. of the... Oh, yeah. Well, I, I can only speak to, to the one, the projects, you know, the, the products I've worked on. Okay. But I can tell you Magic DAC uh, offers uh, code examples for every single function. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you set analog output. That's That's the actual interface there. But you're going to be able to see uh, a code example, uh, analog set analog output example right there, right? There's even a um, to get started if you really want a tour of things. There's there's even this deal. If you buy the, uh, you know, you get the both the Magic Deck and the M and A board, you can connect the two, and this script will just walk through every single feature, and just show you how it works. So. Pretty simple, and I'm I'm sure that other people like you know LabVIEW offer similar stuff, and uh, yeah. Uh, does this work on Windows or Linux or? Oh yeah, no. This is a Win Magic Tech is a Windows only product. Most most uh, test jigs I'm familiar with are, are written for Windows, um, but you can get other DACs, um, like I mentioned uh, NI, or you can get a another thing called a um, a Lab Jack, and then. If you want, you can go ahead and pair that lab jack or that NI product with the MA board. This thing's got a generic interface right there. So you can go ahead and still use this this sort of current measurement relay stuff with other DACs. So, you know. 
let me go ahead and run, run for you this this basic program so you can kind of see what it work mm, looks okay. like. This is like what I would consider this entry level, right? Like let's say you're a small company, you maybe got 10 employee, 10 to 50 employees. No reason to make a GUI in my opinion. Just go ahead and run a text-based sort of interface. So, you know, the operator would see this, they say, Oh yeah, I put the I put the board in the in the jig, no worries. Press enter. It's gonna read that serial number, get the, the date, right? Really, really simple. Here's all your board, uh, you know, sort of parameters. And then it's just gonna go ahead and store that all in a text file like that. So really, really simple. Uh, I, re you know, as you get more complicated, then yeah, you can start introducing a GUI. PyQt is a good way to do that if you're thinking about Python. LabVIEW, of course, offers its own sort of graphical interface, but, um, Personally, I, I lean towards the tech stuff because it reduces the uh, investment on, on development for a test jig. You're not selling your test jigs, you're selling your products. So try to keep your energy on your products is, is my advice. And you still basically get the same results. You don't need to have a nice GUI to read, pass, fail. I would agree. Like I said, as your volume increases, your investment on your test jig can, can increase as well. If you're making 200,000 boards a year, Sure, why not? Make a nice GUI. I'm sure you're having those boards made in, in Southeast Asia. You know, they might appreciate a more simple interface. Go for it. But, you know, in general, I, I tend to skew towards the simpler is better approach. Yeah. So where do we place the test points usually? What is the best yeah, right. place? Absolutely. Good question. So let's just look at that. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. So like I said, let's try to keep it simple. If you can afford to, you're going to want to place those test jigs all on the back side of the PCB. You don't want to place them on two sides because then your test jig hardware gets more complicated. So as you can see here, we've got all of our test points right there on the back. The other important thing to consider is how are you going to align that PCB with the test points, right? In a simple PCB like this, we just have some holes and then we're going to be using just threaded standoffs like this guy right over here you mount that threaded standoff to the to the test interface and then you go you've got a simple little guide to to hold the board against the the test points pretty mm -hmm. simple of course you can get more complicated with it or in highly dense boards you can go ahead and make a cradle on the outside of the uh the board and that cradle can kind of like keep the board in the right the right area to create or oh, do you have can we google for a picture let's see okay again you're seeing these little black uh mounts see how they're on the outside of the board there you could call that a cradle. That's that's sort of guiding them into place, right? I, I've actually 3D printed these things, right? I've, I've gone all the way around. I've taken the 3D model of the board, subtracted that from the solid, and then made a 3D print that you can put on. Ah, the outside I understand now. The so the board is between them. Yeah, yeah, you've got it. Yeah. Let's see if it loads that photo. I understand now. Okay, so these are just some holders which will uh which will make it easier to place the board into the right position but they yeah. they guide it not through holes but through the uh edge of the board outside. yeah the outside of the the outside edge of the board that's right yeah oh i see it now i understand yeah yeah this was actually one of my questions if uh if for example you can uh 3d print uh even this uh uh replacement for the plexiglass because absolutely, absolutely. because uh, you know the company. many companies they have 3d printers but they may not have cnc yeah absolutely yeah so definitely a valid approach it's all about your tolerance right if you're let's take a look here <laughs> if you're like this guy and you've got three millimeter diameter test points go for it you're you're you know, 0.01 tolerance on your printer is going to be just fine. You're going to wind up somewhere in the center, but the tighter and more dense of your design, the higher precision your test jig needs to be. Uh, 
I'll mention that laser printing is not that, ex or laser cutting is not that expensive in China. You can go ahead and get a piece of B, uh, a piece of Plexan that's roughly this diameter. That's about a hundred millimeters square. Uh, you can get it cut out in any design you like. That'll cost you a hundred U.S. dollars. So, I wouldn't be at all afraid about going to AliExpress, finding a laser print, a laser cut uh, manufacturer, and getting it done that way either. Mm, but still, you know, you need to look for someone who can yeah. do it reliably and. That's right. And it, it's a bit of management issue. Yeah, you're right. Finding a, a supplier might take some time. And then time, you have to wait one week for delivery. Yeah. It can get you're stuck exactly on right. border. You're exactly right. I mean, there's all sorts of hack ways to do this or hacks a bad word, but like, let's say less time intensive approaches. Uh, one that's often used is you just go ahead and get a PCB made that is uh, not populated, right? you line up the pins through that here i'll just show you that's what they're doing here they're lining up those pins with an existing pcb and then they're going to solder them after they've they've lined them up right that that makes them sure that they're sort of in the right <laughs> direction to... uh, okay so you put there the yeah, pins key. you put at the board and then you solder them yeah that's actually very important and i've messed that up before <laughs> so yeah do it that way as opposed to pins first and then board yeah that's why it can be useful to have the test points with hall because then yeah. it guides better yeah. yeah that's exactly it because yeah. i've seen on your board uh, some of the test yeah. points they have small hall okay can you show well, that's your actually board? Just a, yeah that's actually just a via going through the going ah, through okay the so you use the test point or you use the via as a test point yeah, but like I said, these are three millimeters. I, I'd be hard pressed to miss them. <laughs> I'm going to hit them. <laughs> They're huge. So, yeah. So this is also a good note uh, that you can use some of the vias as test points and it may be uh, useful to save some space. And also it's uh, easier to guide the needle directly to the yeah. hole. So if you have like very dense board, then you can place the test points also on the top. Yes, well then you're then you're you know that's fine, but your your test jig is going to be a little bit more complicated design. You might need to get one of these Ingen test jigs. These guys, you know, they allow you to get more complicated, and you can apply test points from both sides. But like I said, just try to control your complexity if you can. But if if you have to, yeah, there, I've definitely seen boards with test points on both sides. On what signals maybe we should place the test points so we were already talking about powers but what yeah. about some other signals like clocks or a reset or a... yeah yeah so the deal with let's specifically address clocks typically crystals are very um uh sensitive to parasitic capacitances and parasitic resistances so you, you're certainly not going to want to apply a test point directly to a to a clock line also bear in mind if you're if your firmware uploaded directly to your micro and that's still and that's operational your clock's probably working in fact you could write software firmware that would test your your clock cycle so you know what you can do in software do in software now things that you need to do in hardware obviously things like buttons uh, that you can simulate them being pressed by attaching a solid state relay or uh, loads if you've got a uh, you know maybe a speaker I, 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 for example i've seen a resistive load applied via test points to that. Um, obviously buses, you need to be talking to the uh, the micro to upload its firmware as well as to communicate via, you know, I2C, UART or whatever. Um, what else? Oh yeah. Um, microphone. Yeah, a microphone. That would be, a, that'd be actually funny enough. I've actually seen a microphone tested. What we did there is we, we actually applied a speaker from the test board. Uh, we sort of made like a housing around the microphone we had a speaker on our test board and we ran through a uh, progression of tones and then we made sure that the micro picked up those tones and they were at the correct frequency so um nice so you, yeah possibly um, you can play them to test the output <laughs> yes it, it, that that is well yeah that as well okay. uh in your setup does it support like uh high current uh, different voltages input to test i don't know uh input power range your test your board well it depends on what you consider high current this uh, this guy goes one amp two amps i don't know 
Yeah, uh, this guy goes up to two amps. Yeah, so it's output voltage range one one volt to ten volts. Mac, you know, does two amps, right? Yeah. So nice. This is good for most small small products. You know, like little portable handheld gadgets and you know USB dongles and most medical device electronics, that sort of thing. Um, this is this is nice. I uh, I think two amps for a standard board is just fine. The power is derived off a buck. A buck converter. I can probably show it to you if you want. Uh, here it is. There you go. <laughs> oh, and you regulate the V out set. That's how you set up the output voltage. So this is V out right here. Yeah. Uh, can, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah, and you can set it using this voltage divider. Uh, the data sheet includes the calculation and 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 some specifications as to accuracy. Off the top of my head, I think it's from you know, the out that you set to what you get, I think it was like point, point 0.1 or point 0.2 volts, pretty mm -hmm. close. And then if you actually characterize the board, you know, you go through a sweep of V ins and you measure the V out and you adjust the parameters, right? Because these resistors are going to be slightly off of what their, their tolerance is. You can get a lot closer. It, this is pretty nerdy. Go read the data sheet. We've got some notes on it. <laughs> nice. So next question on my list, uh, we were talking about this. What are the standard sizes and shapes of test points? So usually it's a circle on top layer yeah. or on the bottom layer. And uh, sometimes it or better version is with a hole, maybe yeah, through hole absolutely. pad. So you basically get two choices, a plated through hole right here. You might go with a 1.5 millimeter diameter hole, right? But once again, just go ahead and read the data sheet for your for your pogo pin and mm -hmm. it'll give you some guidance and then the, then your other option is that just that exposed pad for the these pin ones and that might be a two millimeter diameter pad but the bigger you go the more reliable your jig's going to be or you can use the castellated holes for example yeah but i would take you know if you don't have to do that i would stay away from them they're, they're just an added complexity i'll note that your pogo pin options in right angle are much much more, more reduced and they're more expensive so you 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 know your your options for test jig interface are just going to be a lot more limited so if you don't have to do castellated holes don't do them this is actually very interesting design i, I never thought uh doing this kind of uh way to test the board what oh, if yeah. there are components on the bottom how they do it you just put the Mm, well, uh, let's see here. It depends on what it's done. You could always cut, and this is in this interface PCB. You could actually route. Ah, the you can cut the hole in the yeah. PCB. Okay. Yeah, that that would be one approach. Like I said, these castellated pins can be a pain. Uh, these um, these uh, test uh, pogo pins only come, I'm aware of, in two pitches: 0.1 inch and 0.05 inch. So if you have castellated holes on a different pitch, you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. you, you might have to get kind of creative. And then also the thickness of the board matters, right? This might be a 1.6 millimeter that we're looking at here, board thickness, which is pretty standard. But if you have some weird board thickness, you could find out that your, your pins don't align. So like mm -hmm. I said, castellated holes can be a bit of a sticky business for test jigs, at least. From your experience, what were the smallest test points you have seen? Oh, um, well, I mean, we've done some crazy stuff. Uh, you know, at some point you just say, we don't have room for test points. You need to do something else. Right. And in that case, you know, like, you know, there's all sorts of stuff. You can get into the connectors themselves, right. Before you mount a connector on the board, you say like mount the connectors later, later in the assembly process, we'll use the connector pin locations themselves as the test points. That's an approach. Uh, you can write as much push as much of it into the software as you can right write some firmware that goes on that micro that you know measures its own voltages uh that's you know run some lines back to its adc and do it that way so yeah there's ways to avoid it if if you have to yeah okay but still what was the smallest one which you've seen like an actual test point oh i don't know you might you might get a i've worked on a mobile like a like a uh a pendant, a thing that, you know, you, it's, the whole thing's probably this diameter of a quarter and uh, the American quarter. I don't know. They might be point, oh, geez, it was like 0.6 millimeter diameter. <laughs> really? Points or whatever. 
Yeah, yeah, really tight, you know, but you have to, you know, we, we were doing some pretty crazy stuff to get those pins aligned, right? We'd we'd have a very like machine CNC machined uh, cradle that held the board. And then we'd hit that, that test pin. You know, we, of course we had a piece of plexiglass behind it to keep it straight. And then we replaced the test pins. You can, um, if you get a pair of pliers, you can pull this test pin out and replace it with a new with a new pin to keep them sharp. Ah, it was one of my questions actually, because yeah. I thought you have to always desolder them and put them. No, that's a pain. So yeah, so you could write a protocol for your manufacturing facility that says, okay, you ran you ran 500 boards, great. Time to get out the pliers, pull out all the pins and cycle them. Get new ones in there. So, so you, you, you just nice apply and force and you will pull it out. Yeah, they. they uh, I, I suppose it would depend on your your pogo pin manufacturer, but the ones I'm familiar with, they've got like sort of a a little bump that's been sort of formed into it, and so it's just like a, a, fi a friction fit. You sort of overcome that friction fit, and you pull out the the pin and you stick another one in there. Huh, okay. So they're, they're and then like, you can buy like, only the um, tips. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So this is actually two components. Like there's a not pictured like a a little holder that has a spring in it and then this thing sits in that so uh, what uh, language is very often used for uh, yeah, writing I, the test software yeah like i said that's that's pretty um basically it's split into two worlds in my experience you have older firms that have been doing this for a while and you know maybe like legacy products that have been operational for like 15 years they're almost always going to be using labview with labview uh like national instruments like uh data acquisition hardware right and can that you, might be can you show an example of this lab view i know yeah. it's it's maybe your competitor but still I i'm no worries okay because we yeah, are talking a lot about this so i would like to have an idea yeah, no, worries. no worries okay so for a thousand bucks let's see a picture there you go so for a thousand dollars you can buy this thing from national instruments It'll probably have some like voltage input, analog out, analog output, digital input output, right? Pretty pretty basic stuff, right? And then you go ahead and connect that, and you can program it with this visual sort of programming thing. You, you I'm not really an expert to be honest, but I think you like can have some canned features, and you sort of drag and drop them and. To be honest, I really just don't know all that much about it. It's not my thing, mm -hmm. but um, so this is basically kind of no code programming. I wouldn't call it no code. The guys I know who've done it are actually fairly talented software engineers. It's just um, it's just a different approach. Like I said, I really can't talk to it because it's it's not my approach. But uh, I know that it's it's fairly popular, especially at firms that have are sort of been at this since the '80s. <laughs> um, yeah so that's one approach I, I think that there might have they might have some sort of um sdks so that you can interface with these products using uh c sharp the programming language right um i've seen that done in one place um so that's one approach another approach would be uh python that's what i've seen all the newer newer places using uh, a lot of engineers they may be transitioning into the role they don't have specific lab view experience so they're like hey i know python and so most of the newer places I know are trying to trying to write things in Python. So uh, actually, I like this here. Python uh, much more. It looks to me much more simple than trying to learn uh, you know, a software and then put some boxes together. I th this seems to yeah, be like straightforward. Yeah, that that was always you know obviously that was my my approach, my thinking. It's kind of why I made Magic Deck is I personally like Python. The other thing to bear in mind is like there's software licenses, right? For like this visual programming stuff. I think you might have to, to license it from LabVIEW or whatever. So this might be a little bit more inexpensive, but a lot of other firms are following this general trajectory as well. Binho does it all in Python, right? And you're gonna find a lot of the interfaces even for like power supplies and you know, other external sort of hardware that you connect to your computer for test purposes. They're all gonna have Python interfaces. So. so if you would like to use Python on uh, Windows 10, you have to yep. install something, I guess. No, it's super simple, mate. Look, check this out. Um, I'll just show it to you. 
You need two things. That's it. And it's both free. How about that? So you download this little executable, 32-bit Python will work just fine. Download it, install it. Then you get a, you get an, a look like this. Okay, so this is 64-bit Python running on Windows right here, right? The other thing you need to do is you need to, typically the, the hardware, the Magic DAC or Binho or whatever, you're gonna to need to download the, the library that mm -hmm. allows you to use that, uh, to use that software. So for example, you know, Magic DAC, you're just gonna do, it's just one line you do like this right here. So I'll from, what that from the Python, you do this from, from the Python or? Yeah, so I think ah, okay. so literally just this one line, you type it into your command prompt and this thing's gonna check the internet and see if there's any updates to the uh, to the release and see if you know if there's new features or whatever. Let's see if it runs here. There you go. Requirement already satisfied. So the thing is already at the greatest the greatest and, and this library Our, is what you created? Yeah, yeah, I wrote that I wrote that library. Yeah, you can um yeah. You and where it is downloading it. from? Is it hosted uh, on your own server or well, all of mad all generally everything in Python is hosted on this website I'm showing you now. It's called uh -huh. PyP. Okay. Okay, and you and, and you know uh, it's free to use. You can upload software to it, and uh, other people can download it. They just have to use this simple command here: your pip install magic deck, and uh, yeah, it'll download onto your computer and it'll operate. I'll, I'll show it working to you if you want. So what I did is I just opened up a Python interpreter here. Um, let's see here from. So I just told it to go get the, um, the sort of the library, and now we're going to go ahead and make a uh, magic DAC object. And, and then you can use it. You can use the commands from your library. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's do it. Let's use it. Let's do it. There's. Let's uh, check it out. So we have a thing called the hello world example. We can just go ahead and um, I actually have to plug, program in some, I mean, plug in the hardware because <laughs> it is talking to hardware. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> it is actually quite simple. Yeah, that's the whole point, man. Um, I think that's the way the world is moving is is less less time trying to figure out your your test gear and more time sort of like using it, you know? Okay, and then There you go. Apparently, digital input one is or zero is is high. It's one. So. And how do you receive yeah. commands from serial port, for example? Oh, so DAC. Remember that serial. That would be more of a Binho Nova thing. That's that's going to be a digital protocol. Magic Magic DAC's all about analog. So ah, analog okay. input, WM output, voltage output. You know, stuff like that. So you need basically two devices one which just measure everything and the other one which will make you to talk to your board if you need yeah you got it now yeah like i said for very basic stuff you can get away with just the analog measurement that magic doc offers just voltage and stuff but if you if you want to talk to your micro you're going to need a bus controller bin honova is an example of that and it works exactly same way so you uh you install well, these you know, that's uh, different firm that's a different firm, but you know, so we didn't write the software, but that it is essentially similar in that you download a library from PyP and you, you interact with it in a similar way. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Now I understand yeah. how this could be done. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, what is next on my list? Language. So, how smartphones are tested? <laughs> Dude, I have no idea. That is at a density level I've never worked on. Um, I've heard they've had the, they have like many many layers on the boards that I just don't know. Uh, I'm gonna guess that they upload uh, test firmware to the microcontrollers and test it from the inside. You know, basically they they measure all their own voltages using their own ADCs that are inside the the silicon already would be my guess, right? Okay, so. because I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know either. I, I've never worked at that at that um, in that scale. Like I said, I've mostly worked on uh, medical electronics. Uh, things are going to be a lot bigger and, and smaller, lower volume. Okay, so sorry. Maybe some, <laughs> maybe someone else will know, and they will yeah, leave yeah. comment, and they will tell us. Yeah. yeah. So now, when someone like this idea, like, oh, it's not complicated to write the software. It's not uh, difficult to. Or connect the hardware so i would like to make my own test so absolutely how they can do it they need to generate some special data or position of the test points or and then they have to you know yeah it, very easy like i said just um i would just go get some dac uh you know you can program in python and then you're going to want to look at your original design figure out what you want to test leave a few test points and go make a very, very simple mechanical interface like this one. So this is just a, a simple 2D, two, two layer board with a few test points on it. Or, you so, know, if you're uh, feeling... Okay, yeah. so how do you create this simple board based on yeah. the data from your big board? Yeah, well, it's easy enough. You've already got the location of the points, don't you, in your original design, right? So you can see how you'd very quickly just export this design with these test points in these locations. Those test points, the the footprint turns into a, a footprint for a for a uh, a pogo pin, and and away you go. All you have to do is route those pogo pins to a a, a connector that will then go to your DAC module, and yeah, easy enough. Okay, so you create this simple PCB with uh, with the footprint where the test point is going to be soldered and mm. then uh, you route everything to a header yep. which you will connect with for example your device that's right absolutely yeah you might want to use a roofing cable I've, I've got one right here i'll hold it up to the screen and uh that runs off to the deck it's that easy okay and if you would like to make the plexiglass, then you may find yep. someone in China, or you can 3D print it, or... Yep, absolutely. Once or again, you don't you need it ready. even for, like... Yeah, it's, e it's really easy to do. What I typically do is I, I always design my boards with a complete uh, three-dimensional model as well. I just think that's good form. You're going to want to export that 3D model with uh, sometimes I put a three I put a three dimensional object on top of those uh, those test points like mm -hmm. a little tiny pad right I export this entire three D model into a, a mechanical CAD program something like Inventor and then you know it's easy to go from there I already have the locations of the uh, the test points I just make a hole through a piece of plex you know a, a, a two dimensional block and there you go I I have the step file that I need. To pass off to the guys in China to, to make the, uh, the the laser cut piece. So piece theoretically, of you can also add the needle into your yep. into your three D model into three D model oh, of your board. absolutely, absolutely. We've definitely done test jigs where we we design the entire check. It's actually standard practice for practice for us to design the entire test jig in in a three dimensional modeling in Inventor. You see those test pins come down on top of the board. You know, so you can check alignment and everything. You know, we we tend to deal with like more complicated things. That's not necessary for a simple jig, but uh, that's a way you could do it. Do you have experience with three D printing these uh, oh, yeah. plexi plexiglass on the guidelines? Well, the guidelines I tend to get done with a laser because they're typically more accurate. But the 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 cradles, the outside mm -hmm. of the board, yeah, those we do have run off on an SLA machine for printing, 3D printing. 
and then you like glue them on the bottom or what, what do you do with them? Oh uh, yeah, good, good question. Um, I typically leave a hole in the, uh, I make a flange on the, uh, on the cradle and I leave a hole and then I just, I can actually just screw, put a, put a screw through the, through the cradle into the, the PCB and, and a little bolt on the backside. And this cradle, oh, no. it is a little bit like a uh, shape, maybe like this. So yeah. it, okay. You got it. So it just, it just fall. Yep. Right into the center. Yep. Okay. So basically it's easy to uh, insert the board and then it's guided uh, to more and more precise position. Yeah, exactly. You just sort of drop it in there and it finds the center and then you put the, the put the lid down. The lid typically has a, a big chunk of foam. So it sort of evenly distributes the force against the back side of the board and down it goes. Hmm. Okay. Pretty simple. Like I said, we do, we deal with, you know, fairly, fairly simple stuff. It's not that big of a deal. We're certainly not testing cell phones. So still, I, I would be worried like about the laser drilling the holes. That would be something, what it's kind of out of my control currently, what I can't really do in my company. So um, I would yeah. be thinking like how to make it. Well, you can always reach out to us. <laughs> we can help you out. Um, there's tons of people who can do this sort of service for you. Yeah. So do you sell also uh, the whole, uh, the, the enclosure or are you? Have yeah. To... Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's about show on your website, what everything you have. Oh, okay. I can show you, but, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's about finding the right fit between your, your volume of production and how much you want to spend on a jig. We typically, if we're going to do custom jigs, you know, you're looking at a few thousand, low thousands in USD. We'll design that, that piece of plexiglass for you to line up the pins. And then we might make a, a mechanical holder. So this is, is all really nicely put together that, like I said, you know, five, 5,000 USD and down for that sort of kind of quick jig. If you want to go above that, you know, you need a lot more um, precision Then what you're going to need, need to be thinking about is, you know, 10, 15, 20,000, you're buying an ingot here. So you, you don't, don't supply that. these, uh, they have to buy, I don't, I you don't, can supply only the plexiglass and... Uh... Yeah, we do this part right over yeah, here. Yeah, okay. This part that goes inside the ingot. Yeah. Okay. So this is like, like I said, this is 50,000 cycles, 100, 100 200,000 cycles, much, much higher uh, precision. Can you um, Google for uh, this brand? I would like to see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, these guys are the kings of mechanical fixtures. Do you have experience with them? Yeah, the, like I said, they're out of Germany. Um, they're, uh, like I said, the kings when it comes to uh, <laughs> mechanical handle thingies. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that one I showed you on the, on the that's a MA260, I think, which is sort of like entry level, right? Mm -hmm. These guys get super crazy. They, they even have like vacuum ones, right? So it'll suck the board down onto the test pins using a vacuum pressure. Uh, you know, so it just gets more and more complicated if, if you need that, but most people don't, um, you know. Do they have see, prices just, there? Just click on they something. Do not. They, like I said, we're well outside the, well outside the few thousand dollar range now. These are tens of thousands of dollars. Um, but I'm just curious, do they have price? Somewhere. They do not. They, okay. You have to reach out to them directly and ask for the price. <laughs> like here, here, I think is a vacuum one. If I was, if I'm correct, radio freak. I don't know. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, they have ones that have vacuum suction to hold the boards down. But, yeah. So they sell everything from probes up to the whole system. Basically. Yeah, it looks like they do probes. We we typically buy our probes from a place out of the UK. It's it's just cheaper and they're good enough. But uh, yeah, I bet they do probes too. Are you in the UK? No, you are in no, New no, Zealand. No, I'm physically, I'm physically in New Zealand actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the next one. How to make the test run as fast as possible? What to be careful about? What is slowing down the test procedure? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, so basically, in my experience, the number one uh, time sink is actually the upload of the firmware, especially if you're uploading like audio files or something. 
that's going to be the vast majority of, of your time. So you need to be thinking about what is the fastest way I can upload. Typically, um, you, you know, your, your uploader for your microcontroller is going to have some documentation that tells you how to do that. Um, if you're doing big memory chips that need audio files, sometimes you can get the, the company that's selling you those chips to automatically upload the, the audio file to those chips for you, but you're going to need to order, you know, 10,000 chips to make that happen. Um, okay, so then the next thing you need to be thinking about is what, you know, what is the settling time for my tests? If I'm throwing on a big, a big load, can I, can I turn on the relay for that thing? Let it go, let it settle down while I'm doing something else that's useful on the test jig so you can start doing things in parallel. Um, yeah, I, really it's pretty situationally dependent on what you're doing on the jig, but uh, yeah. Are there some situations when, uh, for example, you need to wait for feedback from the person who is doing the test? Like, is sure. this LED switch on and they have to say yes? Yeah, well, you know, that that's, uh, like I said, it's all about complexity in your jig. Most of the jigs we do, uh, if you're doing an LED, you might have a photo receptor on the, on the test board, right? A photo diode. And, and then we'd automatically know that the jig. So the you measure, you use ADC or something, and or yeah. or IOP. It's really simple. Yeah, that that's one approach. Um, depends on how complicated you get, but with a photodiode, you can actually put that through an op amp, which will produce a, a voltage, and then you measure that voltage with the. But with then the, the uh, then you would need to use also the top part of the, because you would need to probably measure it from the top. Uh, yeah, well, it depends. Oh, you on... have you have LEDs on the bottom in this picture. Yeah, it depends on which way they're mounted. The the board I'm thinking of, they're mounted down, so it works really well with the. <laughs> they're mounted through the board, so it mounts. It works really well with the test jig. Um, a good example would be a touch screen. You know, oftentimes there might be a touch screen on a product. It's not worth it to go make a, a pneumatic uh, plunger to to touch the touch screen. You can just have like a grid pop up on the touch screen display and tell the operator to be like one, two, three, four, five, six, right across the touch screen. Good enough. Uh, you know, the operator needs to be there to load the boards anyways. So, you know, making that, that balance between investment in jig design and, and speed of production and automation. Okay. And I had, I, I wanted to ask, ah, okay. I know what I wanted to ask. Can you use yeah. this also to like flash the firmware or you know, oh, I, yeah. I had the yeah, idea, yeah. like, maybe you can use this uh, whole system to basically bring your board totally to life. So Completely. when it comes That's out the from the production line, you just put it there. And then when you take it out, then you have ready product. Absolutely. Every test jig I've worked on, that's completely the intention. Uploading the firmware is one of the key parts of the test jig. It's, it's the first part, right? You got to get the firmware on there so you can communicate with the micro to, to perform some of those, those, uh, those tests. Um, so yeah, you just go get whatever your, uh, your micro, it's, it's going to have some sort of uploader box you can buy. Um, the one I'm thinking of comes from ASICS, A-S-I-X. And uh, yeah, it's just part of the, um, part of the test procedure is you've got a few test points that interface with the, um, with the, like the upload, the, uh, wires, I don't know what they're called, the, the upload bus, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically that, that ASICS programmer can be programmed uh, from Python as well to, you just, here's the file, here's the hex file. Okay, upload it, that worked. Okay, now we talked with it using the Binhonova and move on. So basically once you finish mm -hmm. testing, you can then upload the, the like final firmware and then. Absolutely, absolutely. And check that it uploaded correctly. Make sure your checks, checksum, you know, works out. Oh, and if, nice. If it's good, good to go. Yeah. Do we want to measure power sequencing? Well, that that really depends. It is most of the boards I've worked on for this purpose are fairly similar, si simple. Maybe five rails or less of voltage, right? And you know what? We don't really care what sequence they come up in. Uh, we just want them all up and at the right voltage fairly shortly. So. You know, if sequencing is important to you, yeah, go for it, measure it. But uh, it, it hasn't been important in my in my experience. But I'm thinking it it may not be so simple to measure it actually because 
Yeah, you're right because you're gonna need something like uh, pretty fast. Yeah. But you know, there's hardware. There's hardware out there. Like, um, I definitely know you could do it with a logic analyzer. <laughs> Um, and there's pretty cheap, uh, like little dongle logic analyzers you can buy. So yeah, if you have to do it, there's ways to do it, but I, I've never needed to. So then basically you may want to find logic analyzer with Python support. So you can combine yep. all these different software into one Python script. That's all, exactly right. All the different hardware into one Python script. That's exactly right. But don't be worried in, in the vast majority of cases, all you need is the digital communications with a USB bus thing like a Binho and an analog, uh, you know, measurement device like the Magic DAC. That's all you're going to really need in, in, in the vast majority of cases. Keep it simple. Absolutely. Okay. Imagine that um, we finish this uh, setup, we designed the hardware and software. How the testing procedure normally looks the test procedure document no um, yeah what this document would describe like what the person doing the test uh, what they should be doing or how detailed it needs to be what we would like to include there well it depends on who's performing the testing if it's if you know you run work in a small uh, firm and maybe the boards are manufactured Someone, somewhere else, but you're doing the original, you know, the testing for maybe the first few runs, it can be fairly, uh, per, fairly um, brief documentation, you know, put the board in, run the script. If it worked, you put it in this bin. If it didn't work, you put it in that bin. Very, very brief. But the second that you take that test jig and you move it to your, your um, board manufacturer, typically in Southeast Asia, you're going to need to be a lot more specific on exactly uh, what you do. Um, you, what I would typically do is walk through the procedure yourself as an engineer and write down every step that you take and um, and then give that document to, um, to the guys who are gonna make the boards. That's a good advice. That's exactly what normally we do. Like yeah. <laughs> every single thing what you do, you just write it as next step. Yep. And uh, that's everything for today's video. I uh, would like to thank you very much to Sean for helping me to create this video. Thank you, Sean. And uh, if you have any tips or tricks which other people can find useful when they are testing their boards, leave comments, okay? Also, if you have any questions, what you would like to ask Sean, or if you would like to just provide some feedback about this video, leave your comments. If you like this video, don't forget press the like button. If you would like to see uh, my other videos, don't forget to subscribe. I would like to thank you very much for watching this video and uh, see you next time. Bye.